<coughs> Thank you very much. I'm uh, Nick Harvey. I'm the, um, the head of uh, uh, the Humanitarian and Disaster Resilience Policy Group uh, in DFID. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. First of all, I'd like to very much uh, thank uh, Christine and, and Dan for their presentations. And I can assure Dan that, and all of you here, that the 400 pages that he talked about are actually a very good read. Uh, <laughs> uh, and actually, it's actually very interesting to look at the, the, the case studies and, and, and really get a sort of sense of the opportunities that, it, that it exist in some of the, the countries, but also the, um, uh, some of the challenges uh, and constraints that are, that are faced. I really wanted to sort of talk uh, on two issues, really. One is, one is on the challenge, uh, and two is on, uh, in a sense, what, what, what we're trying to do to try and um, uh, take forward some of these issues. Uh, and I'll particularly sort of focus on the, um, uh, the work of the political champions, which uh, Tom has already mentioned. On, on the sort of challenge side, I think it's, and, and I think, uh, again, I think um, uh, certainly the P PWC report really sort of picks up the sort of, uh, the major challenges that are coming up in the future in terms of uh, you know, basically the sort of scale of risk faced and, and, and the, the critical role that the, uh, the, the, the private sector plays. But it, it's, it, it's interesting. You can sort of cut it a number of ways, whether you look at it from a sort of development perspective, whether you look at it from a sort of poverty perspective. And Tom came out with an uh, interesting report uh, fairly recently on the sort of the geography of poverty and um, uh, disaster risks. Um, or, or actually, whether you look at it from a humanitarian side, there is a sort of the growing challenges faced in terms of uh, disaster risk, um, uh, I think really sort of underline some of the, the key, the sort of key role that the private sector can play. So, for example, if I, the sort of how, the bit of the house from Diffid that I come from, which is more the humanitarian side, I mean, we have a situation where, in a sense, humanitarian needs are continuing to rise on a regular basis. But resources unfortunately are somewhat you know flatlining and uh, you know potentially going down given a, a range of different reasons including the sort of economic situation i hasten to add that that's we're, we're not we're not uh, different itself is not declining in terms of its humanitarian support but it it does require particularly if we we think about the discussions that happen next year in 2015 HFA and the, and the post-2015 discussions and the COP discussions, and then into 2016 with the World Humanitarian Summit, some slightly more radical ways in which, in which we need to start addressing uh, um, disaster risk. You know, and obviously there's some core parts of that. One of them is to, to, to try and support countries themselves uh, better manage risk and, and have greater sort of levels of ex-ante investments, and that includes both the governments uh, uh, um, and obviously the private sector, civil society, etc. But also, how do we, um, uh, you know, start, you know, sort of addressing some of those um, countries facing predictable, protracted crises? Um, and I think for all of those, you can start to see some some very interesting examples of where the private sector has started to engage. So, I think uh, both case studies sort of point to to some of the examples where some smaller scale initiatives, some larger scale initiatives are taking off, both in terms of ex-ante investment, there's clearly some issues on, on the response side of uh, things there, such as the things like the airport work uh, example that you provided, uh, but also in, in the sort of post-disaster uh, uh, reconstruction, uh, etc. So, you know, issues of, um, uh, and again, they sort of talk to the various bits of the circle that uh, Dan laid out in terms of you know, business continuity or getting insurance up and running or the sort of role of the private sector with safety nets, good examples in, in Kenya and, and Ethiopia and how that's then going to be, uh, you know, sort of being uh, replicated in, in places like the Sahel. And then also sort of picking up on some of those other key issues like uh, urban uh, and the, you know, the sort of increasing risk in urban situations and then the critical roles of you know, sort of critical infrastructure, and the, um, uh, again, all leads back to the private sector and their role in terms of, uh, w you know, working with governments uh, and regulators in terms of making sure that that uh, uh, infrastructure is as robust as, as possible. So there's a there's a, there's some very big challenges there. The the key question, as always, is how do we try and take uh, some of those uh, issues forward? And I think, um, uh, as Tom has indicated, the next 
in a sense, the next year provides a very good opportunity to start um, uh, uh, addressing some of, the, some of those issues and um, actually seeing how, how the private sector can be um, uh, stimulated further in terms of its engagement, taking up some of the, the constraints and issues that have been raised. In terms of just a, a few of the things that we're doing, uh, and uh, if I just sort of particularly focus on the work of the political champions, which has a which has a link with the with a with the work that's been um, uh, put out, uh, described this morning, this is a group that's uh, co-chaired by my Secretary of State uh, and the UNDP administrator, and includes a, a range of characters from both the, the donor world, from the private sector world, uh, and from uh, multilaterals, from the UN, from the World Bank, from the EU. Uh, and they are, it's, a sort of, it's an informal group which has come together to try and uh, basically put greater focus and investment on the disaster resilience agenda. And there's, there's sort of re really just two parts to, to their agenda. One is how do you support specific countries and regions in terms of stimu uh, stimulating uh, the sort of uptake of resilience. And the initial focus is on Haiti and Nepal, and there's some links to the work that the US and the EU are doing in the, the Horn and uh, the Sahel. And then the second issue is how do you stimulate greater engagement of the, the, the private sector uh, and resilience? And again, there's a number of uh, parts to that. One of them is, is the piece of, is, is the, in the works that have been uh, demonstrated here. So, I mean, we will have, uh, you know, further discussions when the, the political champions meet soon to, to look at some of those opportunities. Uh, one of the one of the particular um, uh, things that they are focusing on uh, and has really sort of taken off is the role of insurance, um, and uh, they have a, a, a particular initiative on insurance, um, which is a sort of a, a joint initiative between between the basically a set of donors and a broader set of in, in, in insurance companies, basically from the reinsurance world, to see are there a set of opportunities to uh, to to get an uptake in, in the level of market penetration of insurance in, in some lower income countries. So th what they've done so far is there's been a set of um, uh, market studies in, in seven countries to look at uh, the opportunities that exist. Uh, and now they are um, focusing in on, on a number of uh, countries, which is includes uh, Kenya, Haiti, um, uh, the Philippines, uh, Bangladesh um, uh, and Senegal to, to actually do much more in-depth um, uh, country-based studies with, with the governments in question to, to try and see what are the opportunities to actually get some of that public-private investment going forward. And, and again, I think the, the model that uh, Dan has presented there gives a good illustration of the kinds of issues that are, that, that are being faced. And it actually quite sort of emulates the uh, uh, what's being pro proposed in terms of taking a couple of countries, taking a couple of sectors, and getting some some finance in place to start looking at, you know, whether it's regulatory side, whether it's building up the modelling side of things, whether it's building up that sort of that um, uh, the sort of key foundations to allow uh, insurance to take up, whether it's at a, uh, a sovereign or a uh, meso or, or micro level. So, so. This is, you know, this is in a sense quite sort of early days. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of interest in this agenda, um, and I think the the key requirement uh, in the year ahead is being able to take some of these these studies and ideas and start uh, to put them in practice uh, and to make sure there's a strong learning component so that again, obviously, it feeds back and we see see what are the opportunities um, uh, for for taking this further and wider. Stop Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Nick. And, and John, an from an organisation that's done a lot of work on this topic with the private sector, how, how do you see this 